For more on South Africa's latest coronavirus rates and vaccine challenges, we're now joined via Zoom by vaccinologist Professor Shabir Mahdi. Professor, a very good evening to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to The Globe. Uh, thank you for having me. Now, given that we are already experiencing the third wave of infections, uh, SAPRA, as we've seen, has indicated that measures are in place for any crises or emergency. So how can we prevent any you know, cloud of panic among South Africans regarding the contaminated doses? Look, so uh, the reality is, as you mentioned, we're very much uh, in a third wave in many parts of the country. Uh, and even the use of the vaccine right now is going to have little impact, uh, unfortunately, on the trajectory of the current wave. Uh, so, yes, it is really unfortunate that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine won't be made available immediately. But even we, were we to start vaccinating tomorrow, uh, it's really left it too, too, too late uh, to make any significant impact on the current, uh, on the current resurgence of COVID-19 in the country. So how much of a setback is the contamination of the vaccine to the country's uh, already in-progress immunization campaign? What are your thoughts? Well, it's, I would, it is a setback, clearly. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, the vaccinations that's currently taking place uh, will only really yield a benefit, uh, probably at a time of the next resurgence, rather than for the current resurgence. And these vaccines take at least two to three weeks for you to start kicking in and start providing some level of protection. And the protection, again, is obviously what we need to focus on is severe disease. So uh, what it has done is that it has, again, put us back onto the back foot in terms of how soon we're going to be able to get at least the high-risk individuals vaccinated. And all I can hope for uh, is that we do have other alternatives uh, that are made available soon. In addition to which, what we really need to start doing now is we need to start rethinking how we use the vaccines that are currently available to us. Uh, there is an opportunity to actually increase uh, the number of people that are vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine, uh, because some of the recent uh, data, in fact, show studies show that in a setting where in a setting where people have been previously infected with the virus, they probably only need a single dose of the Pfizer vaccine for it to confer as good protection as after two doses in individuals that haven't been previously infected. So we might want to rethink are we actually currently using the Pfizer vaccine? And we might actually want to test people for the presence of antibody, which will establish whether they've been previously infected. And that could assist us in terms of rationalizing the way that we use uh, the Pfizer vaccine. So what will this development do to the psyche and the attitude towards these vaccines by the citizens of South Africa? Because one minute uh, they are told that, the, that, that these vaccines cause blood clots and has actually caused fatalities in some countries. And then the next minute we are told that these, vaccina that these vaccines are contaminated. Do you think people will still be able to embrace these vaccines? So I actually think that uh, this decision by the FDA should actually install confidence uh, in South Africans and globally, because this clearly shows that regulatory authorities take the safety of vaccines extremely seriously. Even if there's any a minor chance that vaccines might not be safe, it is a responsible thing to do to actually withdraw those vaccines. So when we vaccinate people, we vaccinate people to save lives. But at the same time, we want thing foremost to ensure that the vaccines are safe. So I think this is the correct decision. It's unfortunate, but it really emphasizes the the importance that we that we place uh, to ensure that when we vaccinate people, we are vaccinating with vaccines that are known to be safe. Uh, when it comes to the blood clots, again, just to emphasize, the frequency of that side effect is nominal compared to the thousands and millions of lives that vaccines will eventually uh, save when people are vaccinated. And uh, why is the vaccination drive so slow? Because uh, I understand that uh, South Africa's vaccination program is actually the slowest in the middle-income countries in the world. Look, and the reality is that South Africa left uh, engaging in bilaterals with pharmaceutical companies till too late. We already started to make meaningful engagements early in January, by which time many of the other middle-income countries you're referring to had already secured their supply of vaccines. And engaging so late really put us at the back of the queue. And now that is all just being compounded with what we're experiencing with a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So part of it was, unfortunately, poor planning right at the start. We should have been doing those bilaterals last year rather than waiting now. And the other part of it is a consequence of what's happened transpired to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. 
Uh, the other important factor which we still need to appreciate is that the EVDS system uh, sounds good on paper, but again, it isn't necessarily the way to go if you want to facilitate people to be vaccinated with the least amount of hurdles. Uh, again, Gauteng province as an example, and to some extent the Western Cape has now made it clear that individuals over the age of 60 are able to pitch up at clinics to get vaccinated without registering on the EVDS. And that is a correct decision because it's reducing the amount of hurdles and loops people need to jump through uh, before they can get vaccinated. Now, Professor Mari, should we start having a conversation about the choice of uh, the brand of vaccine? Should we decide on which choice? Well, in as much as the FDA is the one that decides, uh, well, in, in consultation with the SAPRA, of course, uh, the, the one which clears the vaccinations. I mean, uh, should we start uh, looking at other brands of vaccines, such as, uh, you know, the other, the, the other brands such as the Sinopharm, perhaps? Uh, so we certainly need to be looking at all options right now because we are desperate to get uh, whichever vaccines that have any likelihood of uh, being able to protect against severe disease, we are desperate to get those vaccines uh, into South Africa as quickly as possible. So short answer, we definitely should be looking at any options, but at the same time, we need to interrogate the science behind all of those options to ensure that they are going to achieve what we're wanting them to achieve when we use vaccines in South Africa. Uh, as an example, there are some vaccines that will certainly protect against severe disease, but they're going to have a nominal effect when it comes to protecting people against mild infection. And you don't want to use such vaccines in individuals that are not at risk of developing severe disease. So yes, we need to be we need to if our we need to keep all our options open in terms of getting access to vaccines, but we're also going to need to uh, reflect as to what purpose we're wanting uh, to use those vaccines for. But in hindsight, can South Africa's COVID-19 uh, rollout be sped up in light of the logistical and the administrative challenges? Uh, unfortunately not, not at this point, uh, because our major constraint uh, is the supply of vaccine. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine, we were meant to be getting about 650,000 doses or so per week for all of June. I've got no idea what quantities are going to become available in July. Uh, so we, we're extremely constrained right now when it comes to having security of supply uh, with, uh, within specific timelines. And that is a major, major problem. Uh, and I don't think it's going to be any different. Even if we were to, as an example, have SAPRA registered, uh, allow for the use of the Sputnik vaccine and the Sinovac or the Sinopharm vaccines, uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to have a flurry of vaccines become available because there's a huge demand for all of these vaccines globally. So we're going to need to, unfortunately, now wait our turn uh, to get these vaccines. But again, the most important thing is not about the number of people we vaccinate, but ensuring that we vaccinate the high-risk individuals as quickly as possible. Well, the security of supply, as we just mentioned, is one impediment. But what about the logistical challenges? So, for instance, opening vaccination centres over weekends. We understand that the Chris Hane Baragwanath Hospital is the first institution in the country to offer these vaccinations on weekends. And what about the requirement that elderly people await an appointment at a specific time, uh, site and date? So, uh, Chris Hane Beraguana is only, only vaccinated. I'm not too sure if they did vaccinate this weekend, but uh, generally they were not vaccinating over weekends. And it raises the other big issue. Uh, it's still mind-boggling as to why government would place restrictions as to where people can be vaccinated. Uh, if people are able to access private facilities, they should be allowed to access private facilities to be vaccinated. Government can't go about creating more hurdles to prevent people from uh, getting vaccinated. That is absolutely ridiculous. I can't understand the thinking as to why governments would restrict the number of people that, get, that uh, are able to access vaccines through the private sector in the first place. Uh, so that's something we really need to sort out. Uh, All right, Professor, great chatting to you. We do appreciate your time. It's a pleasure, thank you.